Pray with me. <clears throat> Lord God, speak to our hearts, incline our hearts to keep your law and open us up to your deep love for us. Through Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Well, unbeknownst to me, Father Peter and I were having similar musings about the poor and the powerless. I discovered that our brain waves were somehow merging out there in the stratosphere when I read the candle, our online newsletter on Thursday. Walls, uh, <laughs> I guess. <clears throat> God's deep commitment to providing justice to the stranger, the poor, and the powerless is the theme that I had been ruminating on since spending time in James chapter 1 and 2. And we will be looking at James. So I encourage you to turn to page 1011. And we'll come to the specifics in a minute. And actually, our reactions are pretty similar. I, too, feel challenged and inspired. I have been inspired because of the beauty of God's character, his care. The Lord God is not like the world at all. So many scriptures tell us that his concern and love reaches out to the humble, the downtrodden, and the forgotten. He isn't a God who can be bribed or swayed by the influence of the wealthy and the powerful of the world. Now, the challenge for me is a little bit different, though. See, sometimes it's hard to preach about the poor because it's so easy to be misunderstood. But also, I have conflicted memories of up close caring for the poor. Many years ago in Turkey, when the, we, there were two of our three children and they were quite small, we took into our home a newly converted Christian young man who was poor. Having a Turk living in our home at all, well, that would have been an adjustment, but the socioeconomic difference added this other layer of difficulty. It was hard to get him to plan for the future, to save up money now for what might come later down the road. And I think about this now and realize how much of his own history would have taught him that when there is money now, use it now. <laughs> and as I said, I have conflicted memories. But also I feel challenged because highlight, highlighting God's care for the poor makes some people uncomfortable because we have to face the fact, well, that we are not poor. Changing our attitudes and perspectives of who is my neighbor touches on some things that we hold deeply, probably without even realizing it. And the issue is as fundamental as that. If we look at James 2, verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor's neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So we already know what God expects. We are to love God. We are to love our neighbor. And Micah 6 expands on what that love looks like, which is to act justly. In other words, do what's right, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. But we really see that James manifests a ton of compassion for the widow, the orphan, and the poor. These are folks who might normally slip through the cracks of society because they don't have family, or the family they do have, they're also poor. In chapter 1, I had to read chapter 1 before I got to chapter 2, we're told that believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. The rich, on the other hand, well, will wither in the hot sun as their achievements melt away. Pure and genuine religion means caring for orphans and widows and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So that's all chapter 1. And as we get to chapter 2, James asks the most pointed question to his fellow believers, the brothers and the sisters. And in essence, it's this. How can you claim to have faith if you favor some people over others? Verse 1 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Discriminating against people is inconsistent with true faith in Christ. And it seems that all the space that James devotes to discrimination, well, it seems like it's a problem. 
among the believers. Verse 6 is very specific. But you have dishonored the poor man. It really makes it sound like it's something that actually happened. So as persons of faith, we reject judgmental attitudes because we're called to imitate God who is impartial. We know that God looks at the heart rather than the outside of a person. And aren't we glad for that? James gives a specific example because this is exactly what is happening. If you look and starting with verse 2, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another one comes in who's poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, oh, you can stand over there or I'll sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? That's the NLT, by the way. The assembly talked about, about here is traditionally thought to be the typical weekly worship gathering like us here on a Sunday morning. But there are some more recent scholars who wonder if the situation is a meeting of the Christian assembly who have gathered together to sit in judgment over a dispute between two of its members. See, folks in that camp highlight that James did not use the usual word for church or ecclesia and also the wording of verse 4, becoming judges with evil thoughts. The details we have appear like community judicial settings that the rabbis describe from the Old Testament and the rabbis. And if you'll notice the, how it ties in with Paul, what he says in 1 Corinthians 6. I'm not going to solve it for you today. <laughs> Regardless, retreating the poor, treating the poor with disdain and contempt is unacceptable. In verse 5, James shifts the focus as to why favoritism is wrong. Listen, beloved, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? See, God is calling salvation both for the rich and the poor, but it seems clear that the poor were putting their faith in Christ. And their conversion is powerful evidence of God's deep regard for people in poverty who have been given an extra measure of faith. It is a stark reversal of status from those who have material possessions and those who have spiritual gifts of faith. It does make me think of Mary's song when she first finds out that she is chosen to bear Jesus in Luke chapter 1. By discriminating against the poor, these Christians violate the law and thus put themselves in danger of being judged by all of it. That's the challenge that Father Peter wrote about on Thursday. Verse 9, well, this is, this is all backs it up. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, but also do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, uh, you've become a transgressor. Verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And just to be completely clear, I am not a liberation theologian, in case you guys know what that is. I'm not that. Elevating the poor while beating down the rich, okay? That is not what James is saying. <laughs> we don't radicalize the status of the poor, nor trivialize the call of the rich to stop oppressing. And in a nutshell, have no undue deference to the rich at the expense of the poor. And frankly, that's a pretty radical message as it is. It breaks our social norms. I know we could hardly imagine not giving honor and deference to someone who appears to us to have power and status. I mean, it would be weird, right? If we behave that way, we would be considered countercultural. James is a but James is painting a scenario where each person who comes into the assembly is a guest. Each 
person is a guest, regardless of their nice clothes or tattered clothes, whether they have well-coiffed hair or disheveled hair in need of shampoo. We all do this because we are valuable and God loves us. We do this because human dignity is a reflection of the dignity that God has already bestowed on us, the ones created in His image. And this dignity is not diminished by outward appearance or circumstances of this person of faith. I have a favorite passage, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and following. Remember, folks... Few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. I just get so excited when I read this passage because it shows how the world values the exact opposite of what God values. And I can relate to being part of the world that's considered foolish and powerless. The Bible suggests time and time again that God delights especially to shower His grace on those whom the world has discarded and those who are most keenly aware of their inadequacies. Yeah, that's me. James calls out the church to embody a similar ethic of special concern for the poor and the helpless. As such, we also do not give undue deference towards the rich at the expense of the poor. You see how it's balanced. The temptation of flattery with a view to gain favor for yourself might always be there. Okay, the temptation is there. After all, it is normal behavior. But don't try to gain favor with the powerful. Because look at this situation. This is what was happening to them. Verse 6, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Contributing to the poverty of most of these believers was probably immoral and illegal practices by the rich. We know that it was commonplace in the first century for the wealthy landowners and the merchants to accumulate land, forcing the people from their ancestral land. Most of James's audience would have belonged to this class of poor agricultural laborers. James reminds them that these are the folks who are dragging you into court. It appears that the rich are even slandering the Christian community. See verse 7 for that. So, how can we claim to have faith if we favor some people over others? If we truly love God, we will express it by loving our neighbors. When we truly love our neighbors, we express our love for God. Now, maybe this morning we recognize that our compassion meter is low right now. <laughs> Be encouraged. Keep listening. <laughs> and here we meet a moment of honesty when we ask ourselves, do we love God? Do we have the kind of faith to believe that we won't act carelessly towards our neighbor? It would be easy to give in to discouragement when we look deep into the parts of our hearts and when we see that we're not really that loving and that's why we turn our attention to one of my favorite prayers of the Bible from Mark 9. You don't need to turn there because you already know it. It's the cry of the heart, so simple, but expresses a deep conviction that the Lord knows very well what we need, and He shows us His mercy. See, the father of the demonized boy asked Jesus to heal his son, and when pushed, says to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. It is that simple. It is heartfelt, and we can relate so well. We grasp at belief. We hold on to hope, investing what small faith what we do have, and ask for more of that. Beloved, do you believe that God's ear is inclined towards you to hear your cries from the heart and actually wants to make you more compassionate towards others. I, I noticed the second time around from our Psalm 116, verse 2, because he inclined his ear to me 
Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Do we believe that God inclines his ear, his ear to me? See, I remember one version of this prayer, help my unbelief, when I was in college many years ago. <laughs> I was a freshman. <laughs> See, I was afraid that God would ask me to become a missionary. And I would have to obey. But I didn't love people. I knew this. So every night, I would ask God, Lord, give me your heart for people. So simple, but it was from my heart I meant it. And God was so excited to answer that prayer. God has a role for us to play as we follow him in obedience, energized and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. See, he wants us to act like kingdom people and work for the Lord because what we do for the Lord is not done in vain. And T. Wright puts it this way. I love the picture. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll off a cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown into the fire. You are not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building. You are, strange that it may seem, accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world. Every act of love, gratitude, kindness, every minute spent teaching a handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care, nurture, comfort, and support for one's fellow human beings or even non-human creatures, yes, he talks about that, and of course every prayer, every deed that spreads the gospel embraces holiness rather than corruption and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world, all of this will find its way into the new creation that God will one day make picture that. This is through the resurrecting power of God who raised Jesus and seated him at his right hand. If we truly love God, we will express it by loving our neighbors. When we truly love our neighbors, we express our love for God. I have been inspired to pray to Jesus the simplest of prayers. I believe. Help my unbelief. So pray with me now in your heart. I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen.